Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come into church, Lord, and to uh, tithe and sow into your kingdom, Lord. We ask that you bless those that are here, bless those that give, Lord, uh, and, and bless their obedience, Lord, as they give unto you, Lord. Uh, we thank you for that, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so uh, if you, <coughs> kind of the last, <coughs> last week and this week, <coughs> they're kind of like filler weeks in the sense of, you know, they're right before Thanksgiving uh, and they're right before the Advent season. So it's kind of a little bit of a difficult time to preach in the sense that, uh, you know, what do you preach? You have Thanksgiving uh, service coming up, then you have all the Advent uh, lectures and slide presentations. So I was contemplating, what do I preach for those two weeks? Uh, and it really was a, a wonderful blessing to be able to talk about the silence of God in that what they call the intertestamentary period of the closing of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. And it has relevance and application for uh, the Advent season. Uh, on, the, on the front of the bulletin, I came in and I saw this, and I really said, this is a beautiful uh, uh, saying that really explains the silence of God, not only scripturally it's based, but also in our lives. It says this, God's silence is our opportunity to remain faithful, even when we are unsure of his intentions for our life. And really what that signifies is faith. It's faith in God. It's not faith in the outside world. It's not faith in the astrologer or the psychic or all these other things or faith in yourself for that matter. I mean, a lot of faith in themselves. We need to put our faith in Christ. We put our faith in Christ and we follow Christ's directives uh, and everything would be fine even if it's a period of silence because during the times of silence, we don't know whether God is doing even more so uh, in the times of silence as he was in the world. When he was silent for those 400 years, he was preparing the world and allowing the world to be ready for the time that Christ was born. The Messiah was born, the greatest event in all of human history, and God was silent for 400 years. You would think if we were God, if you were God, we would be making sure during that 400 years that everybody knew what was going on, that everybody knew what our plan was. But see, God, in his silence, was doing so much. And in, that, in those years of silence, the believers had to live by faith. Those that looked prospectively to this Messiah being born, who waited, Simeon who waited, Anna who waited, uh, the faithful prophets of old that saw the Messiah in the distance, it was silence for 400 years. And it almost appeared that, a, that Israel was abandoned. And... That brings me to the back of the bulletin. I have some scriptures on here. I'm not going to be able to go through those, but they're very informative. Uh, and it really shows the progression, I think, of the silent, uh, the silent years and then God's breaking of the silence. So if you turn to the back of your bulletin, and I'm just going to go, uh, go over these briefly. But the first scripture I have is from the book of Micah, chapter 5. And toward the, uh, the middle of it, it says this, Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who was in labor pains bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. And then he will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And I'm suggesting to you that that may in fact be a reference to John the Baptist. Now if you go a little bit further... It says Malachi, in Malachi chapter 4, the second line says, See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord. So that's telling us, well, Elijah had already come, but as you know, John the Baptist is referenced oftentimes as Elijah in the power and in the steed of Elijah for the great things that he did. Elijah had been dead for thousands of years already, or, uh, or at least uh, probably a very long period of time. So this is referencing John. And then when you go to Luke chapter 1, this is where God breaks his silence after 400 years. So we have the Old Testament, and it closes uh, in the book of Malachi. It closes, and there's no other references, there's no other canon, there's no other uh, uh, directives by God for 400 years. And then all of a sudden, after 400 years, this is, what sa this is what the Lord says. It says in Luke chapter 1, verse 11 to 17, and I believe uh, from my studies and looking at all the Gospels, that this is probably the first words uttered by God in 400 years. And it's very interesting. Let me read them to you. It says this, Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled, and he was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayers have been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. 
he will be a joy and a delight, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before, before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteousness to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So isn't it fascinating that after God is quiet for 400 years, he has not spoken to Israel, he has not spoken to the prophets, he has spoken to nobody, but allowed time to progress, society and culture to progress, to get to the point in history, in eternal history, that he would begin the plan and John would be born, and then shortly thereafter, six months later, of course, Jesus is born. And here we have the breaking of the silence of God. And it's the angel appears to Zechariah, who was a priest at the time. His wife Elizabeth, was, they were very old in age. Uh, they wanted children. They had prayed to the Lord for children. They couldn't have any children. And then, of course, uh, uh, Zechariah is doing his priestly duties in, in the temple. And the angel of the Lord comes to him. And, and at first, he doesn't believe it. If you read the whole story, when the angel of the Lord says and comes and says to Zechariah that your, your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, you will name him John. He, he didn't believe it. And he was struck uh, dumb uh, until the baby was born. Probably deaf too. But uh, he was struck with that because of his unbelief. And of course, uh, a time later, Elizabeth gives birth and they name him John. And he grows up to be great in the eyes of the Lord, great in the eyes of the world. And he becomes John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ. So this is all that's going on. And then look, when you get to John... It explains John's person and work. What did John come for? It explicitly explains, uh, John the Apostle explains who John the Baptist was and what his job uh, was here to do. It says this, there was a man sent from God. So we know that John is sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light. So he's coming to testify concerning the light of Christ, the incarnation, Jesus with us, Emmanuel with us. So that through him all might believe. So he's preparing the world for the light who is found in Christ. He himself was not the light. So people maybe were confused. Is John the Baptist the Messiah? Is John the Baptist the Savior? No, he's not. He was not the light. But he came as a witness to the light, which was Christ. And then at the bottom here we have the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. That's why we celebrate Christmas. Right? God became flesh. He came into the world. He broke the ontological divide of eternity in heaven, spirit, and he became flesh and blood. With blood and bones like me and you, he became a man. Yet he was man, fully man, but yet fully God. This is magical. This is mystery. This is the mystery of the triune God. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. How appropriate, right? I mean, here is the creator of everything. And we know that because it says, in the beginning, if, if I ask you a question, who created the world? And you say, God, well, you're right. But you can even be more specific. Christ created the world. Well, how do you know that, Pastor? Because I know my Bible. Look at what John chapter 1, go back to John chapter 1. This is very important for you to know because the cults, they try to diffuse this and they try to cloud this and, and confuse you with things. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. What things were made? All things were made through him, through Christ. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. See when Christ came he's the light but there's also the darkness that rejected him, right? There's light and dark, light and dark. Mm -hmm. So here you have this kind of, this chronological event unfolding before you in that time period where God was silent. The Old Testament ends, God is silent. People are wondering what's going on. The Messiah never came. Did God forget about us? Is the Messiah ever going to come? Maybe God forgot about us. Maybe God abandoned Israel. 
All of these things are going through people's minds. And then during that time period, people were rising up saying, I'm the Messiah. No, I'm the Messiah. No, I'm the Messiah. And people were distracted and fooled by these false prophets that came up during that 400 period of time. But see, God had a plan, a plan for humanity, and it's the perfect plan. It's a plan that only an omniscient, omnipresent, uh, all-powerful, all-knowing God could uh, execute. And then in Luke, you have the first words when the silence was broken. So as we begin to think about these things, and I think they're very appropriate for us to think about in contemplating the Advent season. Christmas, December 25th. Do you know that that's the day that Jesus was born? Well, that was a trick question. It's the day we celebrate his birth. We don't know when he was born. We know the period of time he may have been born in, but it could have, he could have been born you know, in April for all I know, right? So as we prepare for Christmas and we prepare the Christmas trees, the pagan Christmas trees and all these other things that we do, I mean, let's put this in context. I mean, I like Christmas trees and the evergreen and decorations. And my mom forced me to take part of Christmas when I was a little child. She forced me to decorate. She forced me to get these presents and toys and candy and things that we liked. And I was just a willing participant. <coughs> but uh, with all that uh, saying, you know, I don't want to ever be Scrooge. So uh, God bless you all. Enjoy the Christmas holidays. But let us always keep things in perspective. Uh, you know, that's the most important thing. We, you know, millions commemorate, and I think it's, uh, thank God we still have Christmas, right? They didn't, uh, you know, uh, get rid of that yet. I'm sure they'll try. But thank God that Christmas means the celebration and birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And Christians, uh, millions and millions of Christians all around the world celebrate this. Uh, and uh, all over the world, in poor countries, in rich countries, uh, people know the essence of the season is birth of the Savior, Christ our Lord. Uh, and those words are spoken and those words are sung. Uh, and it's really professions of faith that are being spoken by millions of people all over the world. And it's a beautiful thing um, uh, to celebrate Christmas, to celebrate the Advent, the incarnation of Christ. But, you know, Christians in the New Testament didn't celebrate Christmas. They didn't celebrate the birth of Christ. They celebrated, believe it or not, they celebrated his death and resurrection. I can't find any time in Scripture, whether uh, throughout the whole New Testament, where they celebrated his birth. Now, I'm not saying that we can't celebrate his birth. I think it's wonderful to celebrate his birth. But scripturally, we as Christians celebrate his death. We're very morbid people. You're celebrating a death. You're celebrating his death on Good Friday, the holiest day of the year, the Good Friday, when he took and bore the sin of the world for us and for our salvation. We celebrate that. We celebrate his death. And, of course, we celebrate his resurrection on Easter. But many churches, per se, uh, do not celebrate Christmas. I, I, I have no problem with that. But let us celebrate the birth of Christ. Christ with us, Emmanuel with us. So when we talk about these things, we have an idea of when Christ was born. Because uh, Luke tells us in Luke chapter 2, verse one, that there was a census being done during the time of Caesar Augustus, and that's when uh, Christ was born, during that time period. So we know approximately when that time period was. We know the, the span of years. We just don't know the day and the month. But I think it's important that we give our due to his birth and celebrate it and are blessed by it, because without his birth, there would be no death, right? Without his birth, there's no death. Without his birth, there's no resurrection. Without his birth, there's no forgiveness of sins. So it's a very important day. His birth and his death are very important to us. So we need to focus on these things. We need to focus on uh, the doctrines. We need to focus upon celebrating his life and not be so worried about if we only get five presents uh, instead of seven presents. But here we have the prophecies of the book of Micah saying that his birth in Bethlehem would give a new Israel, a new ruler. His reign would only bl not only bless Israel, but bless the ends of the earth. This is in Micah. See, the significance of Jesus' birth is that God became man, flesh and blood, and dwelt among us, and subsequently established his kingdom that now reaches to the ends of the earth for eternity here on earth. As this was promised... The prophecy said his birth and name Jesus signified salvation from sin. We all need that. We all need salvation from sin. And he made it possible through his life and through his birth and life and death and resurrection, we became freed 
from sin and death if we put our faith in him. And as this was being prepared, John the Baptist would later announce, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What a beautiful saying. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You know, it's almost like John came and John the Baptist prepared the way so beautifully for the Lord. He prepared it so beautifully. God precisely chose Zacharias and Elizabeth to give birth to John. And Jesus said of John, and of all the people in this Bible, and there's great men and women listed in this Bible, Jesus said, no greater man hath lived than John the Baptist. No greater man had ever lived. You're talking about Moses and Abraham and Adam and all these characters and people that are in the Bible. No greater person has lived other than John. And John prepared the way of the Lord. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You can't encapsulate the person and work of Jesus uh, better than John did in those, in those few short words. Jesus' birth would subsequent enter, enter the reign and realm of God's kingdom here on earth. And these were prophesied. It was prophesied it was all the way back in the book of Samuel. It was all the way back in Genesis that it was prophesied. I will raise up your offspring. He will build a house for my name, and I will establish his throne forever. Who do you think they're prophesying? The Messiah, Christ the Lord. The reason why we celebrate Christmas, the reason why we're here gathering is Christ the Lord. See, he was proclaimed by the angels. And he was presented to the world as Lord and Savior. Nothing short of that. He was not this low Christology. Oh, Jesus, you know, you've all heard this. Oh, Jesus was a good man and a good teacher. We should listen to the things that he said. Well, he said that he was God. Follow me. Right? He's not just a good teacher. Or people think he was a man that did great miracles, that he healed the sick and he did these miracles and he was sent from God. That's still not getting it all. No, he was God in the flesh. Everything that you can imagine God to be, he was. Yet he was fully man and fully God. That's how we have to understand who and what Jesus is. <clears throat> when Jesus was young, he was proclaimed to be Savior of Israel by Simeon. His birth would result in the giving light to all, not only Israel, the reconciliation of Israel was found in this one baby, this, this Jesus, this baby. Simeon said, the reconciliation of Israel is here. I've seen, the, my eyes have seen the reconciliation of Israel, but not only of Israel, of the whole world. And then, of course, Anna confirmed that and saying, this is the redemption of Israel. See, the significance of the birth of Jesus is this. There's many things. It established the kingdom of God here on earth for the first time. It established the kingdom of God here on earth. Emmanuel, God with us. And I would suggest to you, up until that point in time, God worked through the Old Testament. God worked through the prophets and, and the great men and women of the Old Testament in this plan of redemption for humanity. But not until the incarnation, not until God became flesh, was God's kingdom established here. The second thing is this. Redemption and salvation from sin occurred when he came. Only through him could redemption from sin come. And he brought peace. He brought peace to our hearts and minds through Christ. See, the suffering and death of Jesus had to occur. So as we expect in those 400 years, it's the expectation of the Savior to come to the earth. I don't think anybody thought that once the Savior came to earth, after that 400 years of silence, that he would be arrested like a criminal, tortured, and then hung on a cross for our sin and for our sake. Nobody would have planned it that way. We wouldn't have planned it that way. We wouldn't have thought it out that way. But it had to be that way. The suffering and death of Jesus on the cross made it possible for us to be reconciled to God. Then, of course, the resurrection and ascension of Christ. Now he sits at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you. That's what Scripture says. He not only ascended to heaven and then forgot about us, he not only ascended into heaven, sits at the right hand of God the Father, and makes intercession for the church. And not only that, he made preparations for us. He sent his Holy Spirit. So that while he's in heaven, at the right hand of God the Father, making intercession for you, he sent the Holy Spirit 
the Holy Spirit is God. It's not a subrogation. It's not, you know, a third level, a third tier God. It's God. The full essence of God, the full essence of Christ, and the full essence of God the Father in the Holy Spirit, of one substance. And these are the things that we have to know and have to understand as we prepare the Advent season, as we come into the Advent season. Whenever one reflects on Jesus' birth, they should ask themselves this. He came to be my Lord and Savior, to save me from sin and death. Have I allowed him to take control of not only my heart, but my life? And that's really the Advent question. The Advent question isn't what we're going to be eating, what party we're going to, what gifts we're getting. All, this, all that stuff is all of a distraction. It's all well and good. Enjoy it, but put it in its right context. The question is this. Is he alive in your life today? And if not, and that goes for all of us, we all need recalibrations in one's life. We all get distracted by things. And, you know, God is supposed to be first, and sometimes he's third or fourth. And then we got to realign things and say, oh, no, Lord, you're the center of my life. Christ, the center of my life. So as we go through the Advent season and we celebrate Christmas and all these wonderful things and family, uh, let us always keep Christ the center. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time together. We thank you that we can come into this house uh, and hear the word of God proclaimed. When the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship because you are his sons. God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. Let us never forget these elements.